going to be uh, introducing uh, the topic and why I think is relevant to study it, why I think is, is, is uh, important to spend time doing research on this. And then uh, I'm going to be introducing some stylized facts from the um, literature on foreign aid, which I think are quite useful and for the uh, interpretation and for the understanding of, of the results that I'm going to be presenting here. Then I'm going to be introducing some theory, uh, especially the channels through which a foreign aid can, uh, can affect migration. They are both indirect and through uh, and they operate through growth and, um, and uh, welfare effects predominantly, but we'll see them in a minute. And uh, talking about also the empirical literature on this on this topic. Um, then I'll focus on uh, um, our contribution, so why we improve upon the existing literature, and then conclusions. So if, I, if I've got time, I'll also um, I'll also talk about further research a little bit. So why it's relevant? So uh, to quote Parsons and Winters, uh, the, the influence of ODA, the Overseas Development Assistance on Migration, is a topic of some intrinsic interest by itself. But we can say that its intellectual interest has been dwarfed by its relevance to the policy debate over the last 20, maybe more, years. And it this is um, even uh, this is true, especially nowadays, because we got the refugee crisis, we got thousands of migrants arriving to the South Mediterranean coast. So, uh, new migration policy has become a sort of a, a key priority for the European Union, especially to. Um, um, so, there's a growing pressure to find an effective way to uh, um, to collectively deal with with the crisis. And in this context, so uh, some politicians say, not all of them, but some politicians advocate that, that increasing foreign aid is a solution to, the, to, to, to the, this so-called migration crisis. So um, it's is sort of thought as a sort of a key recipe to stem migration for flows from developing countries. So the main argument is this one. We create development over there, that's what they say, and so they will not come over here. So this is... This is the argument. So, and one of the um, one of the reason why I started doing this research is that when I wrote this in, in the headlines of the newspapers, but is it actually true? I mean, there is some evidence that 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 points this direction. So that's why I started to investigate a bit more. Uh, so two quotes to reinstate um, this argument. So let's read. So maybe the the, the second one from Barroso. We must also continue our political uh, and development action to improve the living conditions in the countries of origin, working with them there so that people do not have to flee their homes and come over here. So you can see that the argument of foreign aid to prevent migration is, um, is quite, um, has been brought upon by many politicians in the last few years. And the stylized facts I was talking about, so um, um, on, the ed, uh, on the foreign ed literature, which I think are quite useful for the understanding of, of the results I'll be presenting. So um, I don't know if you're aware of the declaration of the, of, sorry, the, the commitment of the uh, donor countries to, to give like 0.7% 0, 0 of their GDP to, de to developing economies in, in terms of, of foreign aid. I mean, even, even though very few countries met this sort of requirement, we can see that ed, foreign aid is, is increasing. Especially after year 2000, we can see sort of a spike. So the first analyzed fact is that the ed, foreign aid is increasing. However, um, foreign aid uh, allocation reflects much more the interest of donors rather than the interest of the recipients. So. We, what, what I mean is that uh, determinants sort of um, like political connections, like colonial relationships, matter much more than the GDP per capita, so the country's needs, uh, the, the recipient needs, actual needs. So here is a very basic regression that I, it's not our work, I, I took it from Kian 2014. As, as you can see, um, the effect of uh, GDP per capita is always positive and statistically significant on foreign aid allocation. So uh, 
it's, it's a distortion. So basically, like the, the richer you are among the developing, in the context of the de developing countries, the more aid, you, the more foreign aid you get. Besides this distortion, uh, the LDCs, so that the countries most in need, um, uh, they depend uh, quite a lot on, on foreign aid. As we can see here, the composition of external finance in LDCs is composed by 72% uh, of, um, of, uh, of ODA, Official Development Assistance. The, for, the, the last highlighted fact that I want to talk about is that foreign aid is heterogeneous. What I mean with heterogeneous is that usually, like in empirical literature, foreign aid is like uh, is considered like the effect of gross disbursements on outcomes like growth or or welfare services, whatever. But I mean, ODA is not only one thing; it varies. There are many types of of ODA, so it, it might be transferring cash in kind, and also um, there is a very large percent percentage of non-transferred aid. For instance, what I show here is that countries like Sweden spend 30% of their foreign aid within their borders, so, which is basically for what costs for host, uh, foreign aid to host um, refugees within their internal borders. So back to our research question, if we want to test whether foreign aid has an effect on migration through in, uh, indirectly through uh, growth or um, welfare effects, of course, like the ad that doesn't even reach the, de the developing countries likely to have a negligible, definitely lower effect. So these are the standard facts. Back to the research question. But foreign aid does actually reduce migration flows. There is something that tells us that this is true in the theory. Well, in the theory, the impact is not, it's not clear cut. We got two opposite, uh, we got two contrasting forces. So we got the income channel on the one hand, which is uh, a positive effect, and the budgetary constraint channel, uh, sorry, a negative effect, and the budgetary constraint channel, which is a positive effect. So the argument is as follows. So the additional income that is created uh, through foreign aid will basically create um, incentives in the countries of origin to stay rather than leaving. So employment and income opportunities so incentives to stay rather than leaving, and this is the income channel. The budgetary constraint channel basically says that this additional income that is created is basically is going to serve like to finance the migration cost. Okay, so that's why there's a positive channel. So for the theory, we got these two contrasting channels, but for the empirics, there seems to be some agreement, some consensus on a positive effect. So. Um, the results con confirm the hypothesis of the view that foreign aid doesn't reduce migration flows in poor countries. So the, the budgetary constraint story seems, seems to prevail. Very briefly on the empirical literature, uh, definitely Faini and, v and Venturini, as the paper pro probably is the, is the most important one, uh, which is uh, what I'm mentioning is quite old, 1993. But it postulates that income growth may fail to reduce immigration because, again, it relaxes credit constraints, which tend to be especially binding in poor context. So this is, this is related to the inverted U-shape hypothesis, which is well known by uh, development economists. So on the uh, X, we got the GDP per capita, and the Y, we got the, um, the migration rate. So we got a positive slope for low level of uh, income, per, income per capita, and the slope becomes negative after a certain uh, a, a threshold. So that's, that's what they use to justify the budgetary constraint channel. So the budget constraint tends to be especially binding in the low, in, in, um, uh, for, for the first part of the graph, and then is less and less binding. Another uh, paper that is worth mentioning is Barthelemy et al., uh, which is basically a cross-section with both bilateral ed and recipient's total ed, which have both have a sin uh, significant positive impacts on migration. I mentioned it because this is, this is going to be sort of the, the main uh, uh, empirical model, sort of the workhorse that we use in our empirical analysis. So they combine both uh, bilateral ed together with total ed received by the country of origin. Um, 
the, the, the bilateral ad is a sort of a network channel because the idea behind is that uh, the more bilateral head, the, the more contacts between the two countries you have, so the more information the migrants have to move uh, to uh, the country where it's sending the official development system. So finally, our contribution. So how do we, how do we contribute uh, on, in this literature? So it, well, I think in many ways. So first of all, uh, the uh, the model of uh, the paper of Bartolini that I mentioned like relies on a pure cross section for year 2000, and we we add uh, a time dimension so we are able to capture the multilateral resistance on migration, which is which applies to international trade but also applies to international migration as well that we've been talking about uh, a few minutes ago. And the most important innovation, we think, is that we introduce migrant flows rather than stocks as a dependent variable. So all the studies that, we, that, I, that, that I showed before, uh, they use like the effect of foreign aid on migration stocks. But these, we argue, that tells little about the, migration, the impact of foreign aid on the migration decision. Because the stocks uh, who are residing in a country of destination may be, may, may be living there for decades. So it doesn't tell you anything about the decision to migrate in year D. So, and we introduce uh, flows and we uh, anticipate that we are, we are going to be having like very different results. Uh, we microfound uh, our econometric model. We run separate, separate regression for poor and rich recipient countries, which enables us to test whether the budgetary constraint channel is indeed relevant at low levels of per capita income. And we add a variety of fixed effects and we, and we include um, uh, several controls for the quality of governance in the country of origin rather than en environmental factors and the presence of conflicts. So this, this is just simple correlation, so we are now into causality here. But this tells us that we already see that there seems to be a negative relationship between foreign aid, which is the Rx, total aid received by, by the country of origin, and the migration, the migration rate that you got on, on Y. What happens if we separate the whole sample in, we split the sample in two according to the GDP per capita? So uh, the pattern would change if we in for different uh, countries, um, uh, whether they are relatively rich or relatively poor? No, we do pretty much have the same results. So this seems to, this seems to point uh, in, in a direction where, well, the budgetary constraints story doesn't seem uh, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem to explain uh, the results here. So it doesn't seem to hold anymore. We use a gravity model, which is built on Bain and Parsons 2015. And of course, this is the workhorse like to bring um, uh, the data um, into an econometric model, actually, uh, to get some estimates out of it. Um, so bilateral migration rates is a dependent variable, and which is a function of um, many controls. So the, our main variable of interest is going to be this one, which is total that received by country of origin at time t minus one. Um, and as I said, like th there are many controls. N notice that the stocks that uh, other papers, yeah. stocks that other papers use as a dependent variable, here we include it as a control, because because of course we think that. Uh, the, 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 the flows of migrants at time t, they may depend on stock because the information channel that you got in a country of destination, okay? So, and this basically will trigger like a migration flow. So the higher the stock, the, the, the higher the flows. Um, yeah, so let's see the estimates. Um, so these are the estimates. We got five columns. Uh, the First, uh, the first uh, three, they estimate the same model with a different, um, di a different set of fixed effects. So what you can see here, 
like in a in a, in a red box. I mean, you, you you can see how our parameter of interest, which is total lead, again received by the country of origin, and is always negative and statistically significant. Um, the third column is our full specified model, and the fourth and the fifth column we divide, as I already already explained, the sample in two between. Um, r relatively low levels, uh, we split the, sorry, the sample in two um, in terms of GDP per capita. And again, we got, we got a negative result. So again, the budgetary constraint theory seems not to be uh, binding. Uh, another sort of robustness check that we conduct is to uh, look at different types of foreign ed. Remember that one of the stylized fact what was the ed is heterogeneous. Okay. Here we use the share of human capital, uh, sorry, the share of humanitarian aid, and the share of technical cooperation. And we got like different, uh, actually opposite results. We got a positive sign for technical cooperation, and we got a negative, uh, sorry, a positive sign for uh, uh, humanitarian aid, and a negative sign again for uh, technical cooperation. The idea behind is that humanitarian aid is less development uh, oriented, so it's sent like it's very much like a short-term type of ed, which is sent for um, emergency reasons. Whereas uh, the purpose of technical cooperation is more towards development. So that's why I mean we this would would point to the income channel story rather than the budgetary constraint story. Uh, we replicate uh, the same model for each cross-section. Remember that I, I mentioned the Bar Bartolomei paper, and it was a cross-section for year 2000. So in the first column, you see what happens when you have like the migration flows, well, sorry, where the, um, um, where the rate is constructed with migration flows, and in the third column, you see uh, the estimate, the yearly estimates when a rate is constructed by using stocks and you always you always get to opposite conclusions. So the dependent variable is, is crucial. So I get to the conclusions um, so in contrast to the previous literature our empirical results point to a robust negative relationship between aggregate ed received and emigration rates so this would give the impression that policymakers in rich countries are right to view the foreign aid sort of as uh, an appropriate, uh, appropriate instrument to curb uh, migration flows and so magically solve the, 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 the so-called migration crisis. But of course, we, have, we are very careful to not oversell our results um, because uh, the aggregate results that are presented here can only provide a very rough guide for policy making and we have we we have stated that by say by distinguishing between uh, different types of foreign aid and we obviously we are focusing on legal migration which is not according to the politicians view in Europe uh, is not like the main issue here so uh, ideally I mean, this work should be replicated with regular migration, but unfortunately there are not reliable uh, data sur sources uh, available. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um,